I thought I would start with one, you know, sort of thought or theme, which I would describe is um, the enemy of our enemy can be our tactical friend uh, under circumstances like we have today. And of course, our enemy is the deep state, the empire abroad, this crazy uh, interventionist policy that we've had over the last 20 or 30 years, but especially what is being driven now by a neocon uh, view of the world, which is uh, really uh, uh, just uh, insane, and we can talk a little more about that uh, later. And the Leviathan state we have at home, this gigantic government, but particularly as it has been enabled and driven by a central bank that is totally out of control and has basically taken the sting out of deficit finance. And I, I make this point because when I started as a congressman in 1976 and then uh, Ron Paul came in 1978 and I can remember conversations about how bad the deficit was then and you can't uh, imagine it was 45 billion <laughs> and uh, we were scared to death. But the one thing that's different today and that goes to the heart of what one of the things we're up against is that at least back then you had a quasi-honest central bank. As you can remember, Paul Volcker was the chairman. He was not about to indulge or enable uh, you know, massive uh, speculation in bubbles. And when inflation got out of hand after the 1978 uh, oil crisis, you know, he put his uh, foot to the uh, brake pretty, uh, pretty uh, dramatically and uh, uh, did not allow the uh, Federal Reserve and the Central Bank to monetize the big deficits that Jimmy Carter had generated and left on Reagan's doorstep. Now the reason I say that is because in the days that you had quasi-honest monetary policy, and of course after Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, it really wasn't honest anymore. You were on a quasi uh, fiat standard, but at least in the early years, the people at the Central Bank <laughs> kind of believed in sound money, they didn't know how much power they really had. They didn't know how far they could go and they had beliefs instilled over decades and decades during an era that we were actually on, uh, the Bretton Woods uh, you know, gold exchange standard or some of them could even remember life in the 1920s and before 1914 when we didn't even have a central bank. The point is they were not willing to just open up the spigot and buy in government debt hand over fist. And as a result of that, you did tend to get what I call the crowding out effect. The bigger the deficit got, the higher interest rates rose. Interest rates rose when we went into office in early 1981. Uh, they were, the 10-year bond was at 16%, if you can imagine uh, anything like that today. That had the effect of crowding out private investment in the housing market for uh, households, uh, it, but especially in the uh, banking market, in the business market, and it created a countervailing political interest. Small businessmen, big corporations, uh, people that wanted to take out a mortgage and buy a home, all were on the side of let's get those interest rates down, let's get that deficit under control, let's get Uncle Sam out of the financial market so that we can compete fairly for the dollars. That's how it was then. Now, the other thing then, uh, in 1987, uh, unfortunately, people around Ronald Reagan, and he had supported, by the way, Volcker all the way through, people around Ronald Reagan convinced him that Volcker really was uh, out to undermine the administration and he needed to go. What they really didn't like was that he was totally independent and that he was uh, determined to keep the dollar reasonably sound, inflation low, and let the private economy uh, go where it wanted to go based on what was happening in the real market for capitalism all around the country. So they basically forced him out and they had the wonderful idea, let's put in Alan Greenspan. After all, he was uh, part of uh, Ayn Rand's uh, you know, uh, uh, crowd uh, in New York. He had written some fabulous pieces. Some of you have read it, this great thing he wrote in 1966 about the virtues of the gold standard and that that was the only thing that basically kept uh, government from expanding to the kind of girth that it has today. 
and the only thing that really kept deficit finance under control. Well, it turns out that over the years, Alan Greenspan had become uh, a somewhat defrocked uh, gold bug, and uh, Reagan uh, didn't understand that, but the, the reason I'm mentioning all this is that once Greenspan got in office, we had the big 20% meltdown in October uh, 1987, as some of you can remember. It was off to the races because he discovered the printing press in the basement of the Eccles building where the Fed is housed. Now, obviously, Greenspan knew all about the printing press, but in the panic of a 20% uh, drop in the stock market literally overnight. Uh, they uh, opened up the spigot. Uh, the uh, crisis was relieved fairly quickly, and suddenly we were into a new era of what I call monetary central planning. They simply moved the Keynesian model, the Keynesian policy idea from the fiscal side, which was difficult to implement because you had all of these uh, difficult congressmen not ever wanting to agree on anything to the to the monetary side, to the central bank, where 12 members of an unelected Politburo could decide uh, when, where, how, and how much to do. And uh, you know, at that point, they were off to the races. And you began this process of massive monetization of the federal debt. That, again, that had the effect of removing the crowding out effect, the rising interest effect, the interest rate signaling to the political system and to Capitol Hill that you needed to manage your fiscal accounts. All that was removed, and so you've had 30 years, basically, of a runaway fiscal process on Capitol Hill because there was no longer that restraint uh, from the uh, bond market, and uh, you've had this uh, enormous uh, engorgement uh, of the central banks. Now, I bring this up because in uh, 1987, when Greenspan le leapt off into this crazy new direction, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve was 200 billion. And it had taken 78 years, more or less, from when the Fed opened for business in 1914, you know, by uh, year by year, a little bit by little bit, this kind of Ohio State offense, uh, two yards in a cloud of dust. The Fed's balance sheet had crept forward because during that period, for the most part, you had reasonably good stewards running a central bank that had the inherent potential to get out of control. When it was linked to the gold, that held them back. When they had kind of uh, human uh, uh, directors who were nearly as good as gold, like Volcker or William McChesney Martin, for the most part, that held them back. So it took 78 years to build the first 200 billion. By the time Alan Greenspan left his term 19 years later, it was nearly 800 billion. Then we had the great financial crisis of 2008, and some of you can remember that uh, period pretty well. Uh, it is very much like today, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Uh, there was a presidential campaign on, and all the Republicans were running around in this primary saying, don't we have a glorious economy? Uh, we are in the midst of uh, this Goldilocks uh, perfection because we and the fiscal side and the Fed over with uh, Greenspan and then his successor Bernanke have done such a wonderful job of implementing the great moderation. Everything is perfect. The business cycle has been uh, extinguished. And, uh, you know, it's onward and upward, full employment nirvana, as far as the eye can see. There was only one candidate who said, this isn't reality, this is a bubble. He happens to be sitting right here, Ron Paul. He was right then, and we're kind of there now, and we'll get to some of that in a moment, where you have Donald Trump who ran against the failure of the uh, uh, <coughs> Obama and pre predecessor economies who called the uh, Wall Street at that time when the stock market was about 2100, a big, fat, ugly bubble waiting to, to collapse, who's now in office has embraced the whole thing, singing the glories of the greatest economy uh, since 2008, and we're roughly in the same uh, point. But uh, the, uh, the point that I want to get across is that um, Trump, uh, is essentially merely the enemy of our enemy. All of that that I've just described, and we haven't even gone into this uh, you know, out of control interventionist foreign policy that has basically destroyed the Middle East, is bankrupting the country, and has uh, basically sullied the good name of America all around the globe. 
The point is, he's the enemy of our enemy that has done all that, and uh, he has no redeeming qualities that I can think of, but there are, is a silver lining in what's happening in this whole crazy Trump era, upside down world that we are living in at the moment. And I want to tick off a couple of those and then, you know, we can open it up for uh, any uh, discussion you would like to have. Uh, but the first uh, point is that he's discredited, discredited enormously the imperial presidency. And I think that is a wonderful thing because partly the, partly the reason why our foreign policy has been so interventionist, has been so destructive, been so costly, has been such a big failure, is that an unelected group around the presidency in what we now call the deep state, the National Security Council, all of the 17 different intelligence agencies deep in the bowels of the State Department and the National Endowment for Democracy, to say nothing to the Pentagon, and uh, you know the military industrial complex and all the NGOs and all the think tanks. I mean, there's literally dozens and dozens of think tanks who live one way or another off government money through the back door or foundation money uh, that's in the business of promoting the empire, promoting the neocon view of the world, promoting our intervention everywhere from the Idlib, Idlib province uh, in Syria uh, to uh, we're still, you know, in North Korea uh, 68 years after the war shouldn't have started in 1950. So uh, the point is that the imperial presidency is at the heart of that. I mean, as a lot of you know, and as we all write about in our different publications all the time, <clears throat> we haven't had a proper war declared uh, since, uh, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor. And the fact is that if presidents had to go to Congress to get funding for uh, the war and get a, uh, a declaration of war, half of these interventions that we're, we've been involved in, I wouldn't say half, I'd say 98% of them never would have happened. And you know, we had a good example of that uh, not too long ago, which kind of set up the mess that we're in uh, uh, with Russia and Putin today. So I want to digress a little bit and mention that because in that particular case, the imperial presidency was occupied at that point by Barack Obama. Uh, he had put out this stupid red line which said, uh, you know, we don't really know what's going on in Syria, but if somebody uses uh, uh, chemical weapons, that's the red line we're coming in, uh, you know, whether you had any proof that uh, Assad did it or some of our so-called allies and uh, uh, free uh, 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 rebels did it, or the jihadists that the so uh, Saudis were supporting. It didn't matter. He drew the red line. The attack happened in Gota, I think, I believe it was, uh, in August uh, 2013. And the next thing you knew, he, he was, uh, Obama was called on his red line and he hesitated first when the British uh, refused to join, and then secondly, uh, he kind of uh, decided to throw the ball to Congress, ask them for a resolution of support, it never happened, and that gave Putin a wonderful opportunity to step in and say, we can, we can cool down this situation by uh, convincing Assad to give up his chemical weapons, remove the uh, cause for war, remove the cause for the red line, and hopefully bring some sanity back to the situation. Well, that's exactly what happened. And as a result, uh, we, we had a more sensible policy for the moment, except the neocons in the whole military foreign policy establishment were outraged that they were on the verge of regime change in Syria, which they desperately wanted. That was on the list. Uh, we'd already had it. Uh, uh, by that point in time, obviously in Iraq, we had had it in Libya, Syria was next, and Putin deftly stepped in and removed the ca uh, cause for a war. So six months later, uh, the coup, uh, the uh, uprising begins on the streets of Kiev, the so-called maiden uprising, and the next thing we know, all the neocon politicians from McCain and all the rest of them to the State Department uh, 
uh, and the local ambassador and the National Endowment for Democracy and operatives of the CIA posing as State Department personnel and so forth were all over the place uh, fomenting the coup, financing the coup, and recognizing immediately, within hours, a government that was formed out of a lot of nationalist Ukrainians and even some neo-Nazi elements uh, that uh, was as illegitimate as you can possibly imagine, but it was recognized, and that set off this whole demonization of Russia and Putin because obviously they had to respond. And the reason they had to respond is it's on their doorstep. It's like uh, if there was some kind of uprising uh, that occurred you know, on the border of Arizona or New Mexico. And uh, particularly, I just want to mention the uh, craziness that developed on, with regard to the uh, so-called annexation of Crimea. Uh, because that is what has triggered this whole range of sanctions and this whole rapidly escalating uh, Cold War 2.0 between Russia and the United States. And, uh, you know, when you listen to the Washington Pals and uh, policymakers and the neocons, it's as if, you know, Putin were some kind of uh, latter-day uh, Hitler on the move, uh, taking territory. And here's the ironic part. There is nary a Ukrainian-speaking person in Crimea because Crimea was never part of the Ukraine. Crimea was always Russian. It was per, uh, purchased for good money in 1783 by Catherine the Great from the Turks, who were always bankrupt and always needed, needing money. It became an integral part of the uh, mother Russia in the uh, era of the Tsars. Their great uh, fleet, uh, Black Sea fleet, was uh, home ported in Sevastopol right on the uh, peninsula. In fact, everybody here has probably read The Charge of the Light Brigade, the great Tennyson poet, uh, poem that occurred on Crimea when the invaders were coming. Well, who were the invaders? What was the English, the French, uh, and the Turks? And who were the defenders? The Russians. <laughs> uh, that was the great uh, patriotic moment in Russian history. So the point is, uh, it never was part of Russia until uh, 1954, the Soviet Union was in its uh, midlife. Uh, the, the succession struggle happened after uh, uh, Stalin, uh, fortunately, passed uh, from this life. And uh, Khrushchev won the struggle, as all of you remember, uh, liquidated his enemies. And by the way, there's this great funny movie out now that you might want to look at, uh, um, with making fun of the uh, Russian succession at that time. Um, I'll think of the name in, uh, in a moment and uh, pass it on to you. But anyway, as a reward for his allies who helped him liquidate his two opponents, Berea, who ran the uh, KGB, uh, and a second opponent, he uh, awarded the Ukrainian com comrades who had helped him by uh, having the Presidium pass a decree moving Crimea from the Soviet Socialist Republic of Russia to the Soviet Socialist Republic of the Ukraine. So you know, that's how it became part of the Ukraine. The Presidium ordered it. And so here we are, uh, 70 years later, saying the essence of our foreign policy is to enforce the, the writ of the dead hand of the Soviet Presidium uh, from 1954. Okay, so that, that just gives you some feel for how far this whole empire has gotten out of control. And it's all happened. Uh, all, the, all of this policy maneuvering has all happened because of the imperial presidency and too much power in the uh, Oval Office. And uh, for whatever uh, you, know, you may say about Trump's uh, characteristics and his character, uh, is bombastic and uncouth and unpleasant and so forth as he is, he is making the imperial presidency look bad around the world. And frankly, I think that's a good thing because next time we declare a war, maybe no one will come because uh, who wants to be part of that? And really, uh, that's a little bit facetious, but it's actually true. People are now starting to think around the world about their own interests rather than being just uh, 
you know, robotic uh, uh, adherence to the Western alliance or to NATO or whatever. Clearly, the Germans are going their own way. There's several countries in Eastern Europe, particularly Hungary, uh, and now Italy and others. And this is all a good thing because we don't need an empire. We are not uh, appointed to be the policemen of the world. We can't afford it. We're going bankrupt doing it. And everything we've tried uh, has failed and has been a shambles anyway, uh, you know, from uh, one side of the Middle East to the other. So that's the first thing he's doing. Second thing, he's discrediting the spy state. And uh, I think that's a good thing because the Republicans were so in the tank for that whole apparatus of 17 so-called intelligence agencies and had given them so much money that they really were out of control. Here's a statistic that I think is pretty shocking, but uh, indicates sort of the magnitude of why this is a problem. The combined budget of the 17 so-called intelligence agencies, and that includes the CIA, the DIA, the FBI, and all the other acronyms. Uh, every department has some kind of uh, intelligence operation or more, more than one, is 75 billion. Now that's a pretty staggering number because it actually exceeds the entire defense budget of Russia, which is 60 billion. And uh, when you think about it, that 60 billion has to pay for the fuel, the, set of the pay of the, uh, their armed forces, uh, the boots, the ammunition, the planes, the ships, the whole ball of wax they spend 60 billion on. We, of course, spend 720 billion. But we spend more on our intelligence uh, agencies than the entire budget uh, of the alleged uh, uh, reason why we have to have such a, a massive uh, national defense program anyway. So what has happened here is that the intelligence community got over its skis, led by Brennan, right in the cusp, uh, former CIA director, right in the cusp of the 2016 election, when Trump, I don't think Trump really has any foreign policy views. I mean, you know, I've, I wrote a book, you, some of you had my book, and I said Trump's better than the alternative, and we can all appreciate that. And he did have sort of a notion that maybe we were overextended, maybe we didn't need to be meddling and intervening everywhere, but it was a pretty uh, superficial, top-of-the-head view, but at least he had enough strategic sense to say, we don't, why are we having this confrontation with Russia, with Putin? I mean, I think Trump up there in, uh, uh, you know, had an epiphany up there in Trump Tower as he looked out, he said, my God, I can see Russia from here. <laughs> and uh, unlike uh, Sarah Palin, who could see the landmass of Eurasia uh, from Anchorage or somewhere, he actually could. <laughs> Because what I'm talking about is the GDP of New York metro area, which you can see from his lair in Trump Tower, is 1.6 trillion. And the GDP of Russia is 1.4 trillion. In other words, the GDP of New York is bigger, in this, and we're supposed to be shivering in our boots uh, that, that Russia is some kind of existential uh, threat to national security, that we need this uh, massive... Uh, defense budget, number one, but more importantly, this c uh, confrontation. You know, uh, uh, Trump, the real estate developer and con artist, said, hey, maybe that doesn't, sound, that doesn't sound right to me. Maybe I, and he has, you know, overweening confidence in his ability to convince people of things, uh, thought, well, maybe I can convince uh, Putin uh, that we can uh, settle differences and work together and reduce, uh, uh, you know, the conflict in the world and the cost of all this. He was right about that, and the whole deep state went nuts. And that's why they unleashed this whole uh, FBI-based, CIA, Brennan, top office-driven, uh, you know, meddling in the campaign. So it's turning out. I think it's absolutely clear now, and all these great documents are now going to finally be uh, de uh, declassified, and everybody's going to see them that the only meddling that occurred in the 2016 election was the meddling by our own deep state, top-level uh, national uh, security uh, operations designed to do whatever they could to undermine Trump's candidacy and promote the establishment uh, uh, designee. And this is all going to come out. And the reason I think this is uh, so important and so good is that it's, be it's become a partisan issue.
So now all of these Republican robots who would always line up and say, how much more do you need uh, CIA? How much more do you need DIA? Are suddenly realizing that these are dangerous, vast uh, mechanisms with great resources that can be turned against them politically to say nothing of the larger issue of how do you run a constitutional democracy if the government is undermining uh, its own elections. So I think this is a huge thing. I don't know exactly how it'll come out. I'm really confident now that Mueller is going to be a total big nothing burger, an embarrassment. I write about this stuff a lot in my blog, but uh, and without getting bogged down in it too much, it's just the, the level of trivia that the other side has come up with uh, in order to support its increasingly thin case is undermining the whole idea that we need 75 billion and this massive shield of secrecy and all this classification and so forth when you find out what they're doing behind the screens. It's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. You find out that there's some little uh, weasen guy back there uh, that isn't uh, scary at all. And you know, you're gonna find out now that this meeting at Trump Tower, you know, th this was really, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of seminal event, as uh, the other side is claiming, that shows the nefarious uh, 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 intention of the Russians and operations of uh, trying to uh, collude uh, with the Trump campaign. Well, you know, just look at the facts. The person that Putin allegedly sent was, uh, you know, a 29-year-old lawyer who didn't speak English. Okay, and you're going to send that kind of uh, agent, that kind of secret agent to Trump Tower right then and there in the heat of a presidential campaign to make a deal on how we're... It had nothing to do with the election. She was there uh, for a good mission, which was uh, uh, lobbying against this Magnitsky Act, which is another old story. If we, sometime if we ever have time, you know, go into that. That's uh, a real uh, crock that is partly behind all this tension that's been created. But anyway, the so-called Trump Tower meeting is a joke, right? And the people in the Trump campaign who were allegedly being recruited by the Russians were such low-level wannabe volunteers in the campaign that they never even met, met Trump. You know, Carter Page never met him. <laughs> uh, Carter Page was just a guy trying to make a living and get a little visibility for himself. Uh, and here, after all this time, he's still not indicted because one, there wasn't uh, any uh, collusion, and second, uh, still, that they were able to get FISA warrants from this system that we say has been so well honed and so carefully structured to pr protect the Constitution while uh, uh, you know, enabling uh, security operations that need to be done if that is true, and that's the image, you know, that uh, Washington wants you to believe the deep, deep state uh, keeps uh, uh, raising up, if it was that well choreographed and that well crafted, how in the world did they come up with this nonsense that they put before the FISA judge and get a warrant to uh, surveil a low-level guy in a presidential campaign where they had, you know, zero uh, probable cause in any uh, reasonable reading of uh, the information. Now that is a, an alarming thing. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not to you know, get us all worked up about how dangerous the deep state is. We already know that. It, what it's done is re, uh, opened the eyes of Republican politicians on Capitol Hill to how far this thing has gotten out of hand and we're just beginning to see the beginning of it now. I think there are going to be hearings. There's going to be exposure. Hopefully, there'll be some reform. Hopefully, there'll be some curtailment of this great spy state. We call it surveillance state. And some reduction in these massive uh, resources they have. But the biggest thing going on is I think bubble finance uh, is being discredited. And that's because... <laughs> Uh, you know, you can look at Trump's program and it goes from bad to awful, okay? You can start uh, with the idea that uh, we have a big trade problem, which we do, uh, and it's caused by bad trade deals, which it isn't. It's caused by bad money, and if he wanted to solve the problem, he would go after the, uh, the, cor the course of, uh, source of it a few blocks down the street in the Eccles building, uh, 
But so the first thing is we're going to have a trade war, which uh, is going to really devastate the whole uh, international system based on central banking. And that will uh, actually be painful in the short run, but positive uh, in the longer run. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I, if I had to boil it down to two words, his policy is fiscal debauchery. I mean, I haven't seen any, we've never seen anything like this, even from Democrats in terms of, uh, you know, this massive tax bill. I know everybody likes it, but in the 10th year of a recovery, when you already have a built-in deficit uh, that's running uh, at 3 or 4% of GDP, you don't lay on top of that uh, a tax cut that is poorly designed and is basically going to go to stock uh, buybacks anyway without offsetting cuts in spending in order to bring this deficit under control. Uh, you know, we can spend a huge amount of time on where we're going, but I'll tell you, it is in a very bad place because built in when Trump started for the next 10 years was about uh, 10 trillion worth of deficits. He's already added 4 trillion more uh, through the tax bill and through all of these huge increases for the Pentagon. And then to get the Pentagon increases, they had to give all the uh, pork bell, barrel politicians their side. So they got 80 billion for defense cost them 60 billion more for a domestic pork barrel of one type or another. And all the while, there was a conspiracy not to say boo about the entitlements, you know, which are two and a half trillion dollars a year and nothing is being done. So the reason I bring this up is no one has abolished the business cycle. You know, they didn't pass a law saying the business cycle is hereby, uh, ex uh, you know, uh, extinguished. We are now in month 111 of this so-called expansion. It's the lo second longest in history, the weakest. The longest was 119 months. That was in the 1990s when there's a lot more uh, tailwinds and far fewer headwinds than we face today. So the idea, and this is uh, the core of why there's a you know, fantastic uh, fiscal calamity coming, the idea that's built into the CBO uh, projections and all the other 10-year budget uh, projections you look at is that we're going to go to 2028 without another recession, which would mean that totally there would be 232 months of consecutive expansion uh, between now and then. And it's never happened in human history. It's three times the normal business cycle is double the longest one in history, and it doesn't take into account all the things that are going on around the world that are difficult, and uh, to say nothing of the size of our deficit. Now, why that's important is that if you actually take the CBO economic forecast and strip out the rosy scenario, and that is interest rates that are way too low, because we're going to get a yield shock uh, in the market. Uh, and you factor in a reasonable business cycle. You know, you're going to have a recession sometime in the 1920s. That adds another five trillion because you have the revenue loss and all the other impacts to the budget. So to boil it down without getting lost in numbers here, I'm absolutely convinced that we're going into the next 10 years, the 2020s, with built in 20 trillion of new deficits, 10 years, 20 trillion, two year, two trillion a year average. That'll take the national debt from 21 today to 41 some uh, by 2028 to 145 percent of GDP. A non-viable situation in, a, in an economy that's gotten old. The baby boom will be entirely retired by then, or nearly retired. Uh, there's 50 million people uh, over 65 today, of which some of us here are part of that group. I'll, I'll uh, <coughs> uh, volunteer to be part of that. But there will be 100 million people over uh, 65 uh, three decades from now. So you have this massive demographic wave coming that will suck the welfare straight dry. And that's what you're heading into. And the worst thing you could possibly do is uh, sort of add to the uh, structural deficit uh, right now. Uh, and expect to get through that period. You won't. I mean, there, the, the whole thing is going to come undone. Now, in the short run, the Keynesians, who are still in charge of the Fed, are patting themselves on the back because just like in 2008, when Ron Paul said, this is a bubble, this isn't prosperity, they think they've created you know, the be-all and end-all of prosperity, 3.8% unemployment, 
one quarter of 4% GDP growth, so what? Those ha they come and go. The average has been terrible. But they think they've created a strong, solid, uh, uh, nearly perfect economy, and so therefore now they're ready to plow ahead and normalize interest rates, as they call it, and um, uh, shrink the balance sheet of the Fed. Now, we know how crazy this was. As I said, it went from 200 billion to 4.5 trillion uh, in less than uh, 30 years, so that's a 22-fold increase. They're now finally going to roll that back. The reason I bring this up is that I believe they will do that until finally the whole system comes undone, something big and nasty uh, b bursts on Wall Street, and by then it, it will be uh, too late. So think about what's going to be coming down the pike then. In the year ahead, to, uh, thanks to the fiscal debauchery uh, out of Washington from the Trump Republicans and what was already built in from both parties in the welfare state, in the warfare state, and so on, and lay that against what the Fed is doing. And there you have the collision, the mother of all uh, financial collisions, because the U.S. Treasury starting October 1, which isn't that far from now, will have to borrow 1.2 trillion next year. And that's about the biggest ever, but it's in year 11 of a recovery, not year one or at the bottom of a recession when private credit demand is at low levels and so forth. Nothing like it has ever happened. You know, when we were in year 11 of the only other business expansion of this length, which was, as I say, the 1990s, it was the spring of 2000. The budget was in 2% of GDP surplus. Uh, the Federal Reserve still had basically an untapped balance sheet. It was a totally different environment. Here we are today, and we're going to be borrowing 6% of GDP, 1.2 trillion. But here's the uh, punchline. The uh, Federal Reserve finally is going to be shrinking its balance sheet under what they call QT, quantitative tightening, by 600 billion per year annual rate. So if you do kind of the elementary math, the elementary addition, you're going to have 1.8 trillion of new or existing debt that the Fed and the Treasury will be dumping into the bond pits to see uh, where it's all going to be absorbed. And it will be absorbed. The market's always clear. But it's going to clear, in my view, at a much higher rate than uh, the rates that exist today, and they're already moving up quite uh, strongly at the front end of the curve, and they will be uh, towards the middle and back uh, very soon. You know, the 10 years already pushing 3.1%, and it'll be over that shortly. But more importantly, the front end of the curve is just soaring. You know, the 90-day the, uh, Treasury bill during this whole period of massive money printing and so-called financial uh, repression was down on the zero bound, as they call it, pinned to the floor on Wall Street at about 20 basis points for eight years. You can look at a chart. It's like a big uh, soup bowl. And it goes down at the time of the crisis from a reasonable rate to 20 basis points, stays there for eight years, and now it's shot back up to 220. In other words, just in less than a year, uh, the front end of the curve has started to lift as the Fed has taken its foot off the neck of the uh, money market. And uh, just add that together and you're going to have one huge yield shock uh, in uh, the bond market and that will ricochet into the entire financial system because remember the 10-year bond yield which has been kept so artificially low is the benchmark that drives the entire financial system every other kind of security is priced off from that uh, including other governments around the world including investment grade uh, U.S. corporates, and then from there uh, to lesser grades and to junk and so forth. Everything prices off the 10-year, and the, level, the cost of debt, of course, drives uh, the level of uh, price level of risk assets, equities, and the others, because uh, the cheaper the debt, uh, the more you can leverage uh, risk asset positions and thereby drive up the price. Anyway, I think this whole thing is coming to a big conflagration, and it would have happened anyway, but the silver lining of Donald Trump is that the Fed is filled full of all kinds of proper establishmentarians, 
and they're not about to be pushed around by this uh, wild man, interloper, uncouth uh, liar, as uh, the establishment press wants you to believe, and you know, it's mainly uh, correct. And so they're going to dig in, they're going to dig in and do what they think their Keynesian lights are telling them to do, which is to ra keep ratcheting up rates and keep shrinking their balance sheet until some furniture breaks all over the floor of Wall Street, and then it'll be too late. Um, and that, uh, in combination with the massive uh, expansion of the fiscal uh, uh, requirements, is really finally going to bring the system to some kind of crashing halt. Now, what that means is if you happen to be an investor, I wouldn't be anywhere near Wall Street, the bond or the stock market, uh, at least for the next uh, couple years, because there truly is going to be a, a monumental collision. And you will have, I will tell you, a government that is totally non-functional. Now, that's my last point. We all celebrate our Madisonian democracy. In other words, the Founding Fathers were skeptical enough about uh, the temptations of political power that they designed a mousetrap that basically couldn't work. So many checks and balances and two houses and vetoes and so forth and so on. Normally that's a wonderful thing. It's the one structural feature of our democracy that keeps the Leviathan from getting as you know, enormous as it is in socialist Europe. But we are now imposed a runaway fiscal train on the system that cannot be stopped unless somebody cuts spending through a majority act of both houses that then has to be signed, uh, or reforms entitlements in the same way, or God forbid, raises taxes in the same way. What I'm telling you is the welfare state is so out of control, the warfare state is now so dug in and we're so uh, exposed everywhere around the world that there is not a snowball's chance of getting a majority in Congress to act to stop the fiscal freight train. It's left the station. It's out of control. We're going into two trillion plus deficits. That will smash up against uh, a Federal Reserve that's finally decided to stop monetizing the debt. That's really what QT is. They finally decided They've done such a wonderful job that they don't have to engage in financial fraud after 30 years and, and continue to monetize the debt. That will create the mother of all yield shocks. That will send the market into a tailspin that can't be retrieved because unlike 2008, when George Bush was sitting there and you know dazed and suddenly got convinced that to save uh, the free market, he would uh, you know, suspend the free market. Uh, or you remember his famous phrase, uh, if we don't do something, this sucker is going down. Well, uh, what's happening this time is that the sucker is going down and the political system is in such bad, bad shape. It's so frayed. It is caught up in such intense, uh, nasty partisan warfare that this uh, spectacle going on right now on TV as we're all sitting here uh, is emblematic of that when the crunch comes, when uh, it's September 2008 again, there's going to be no unified response. They will not be able to put it together. I think we've had the last bailout. And then suddenly, and all that's built up over the last 30 years, this massive debt, government that's expanded everywhere, a warfare state in a foreign policy that we can't afford, a, uh, a central bank that is basically destroyed honest free market capitalism uh, in the financial system, which is the heart of uh, capitalist prosperity. All of this will finally be exposed. Now, my last point is, wh where does that lead us? And my answer is, I do not know. But at least it is better than what would have been the case had Hillary been elected and we would have continued to drift down the road of you know, more and more debt, a Fed that uh, thinks it uh, needs to run the world, a foreign policy uh, that was failing by the day. I think at least all of that is going to come to a grinding halt, and maybe there'll be a chance for some gigantic re-education of the American public and the American electorate when they see what a mess the uh, political class in Washington and the deep state uh, 
uh, that uh, they uh, serve uh, has finally brought all of this to. So those are uh, some comments that took a little longer than I thought, but uh, I hope that was useful. Thank you. I was always perplexed why there wasn't hyperinflation or more inflation after all the Q, uh, quantitative easing. Yeah. And I'm still perplexed by that because, you know, inflation is just printing money. Yeah. And so if you have any comments yeah. on that, I'd appreciate it. Oh, that's a great question. And actually, I write about it uh, almost every day in my blog. And the thing is, when we say hyperinflation, we think of Germany, 1923. But if you look at 1923, their price level in the United States was flat. It was inflation in one country because they massively expanded their currency, but uh, people had alternatives and there was an enormous flight uh, from the D-mark at the time into anything else, gold, uh, the pounds, uh, guilders, etc. And that's what caused the whole thing to soar. We're in a different world where the money printing has been global, it's been planet-wide, and as the Fed printed all this money, it didn't cause inflation because it created excess balances in our accounts with the rest of the world. But rather than do what old good old Milton Friedman thought, you know, he's the one that basically convinced Nixon to shut the, uh, the gold window and uh, destroy Bretton Woods. He said, we'll just have, uh, you will have a free market in currency and the exchange rates will be set on the free market and that's what we should do. Uh, we don't need this rigid uh, gold-based system. Well, he was in theory right, except there never was a free market in exchange rates. It was a dirty float from day one. And central banks everywhere decided that if there's too many dollars coming at us, they no longer had the option of going to the gold window for gold and turning in the dollars, that they would basically uh, buy in the dollars through exchange rate intervention, stuff them in their central banks, and print their own currency in lieu thereof. And that's why if you look at things, it's crazy. China had uh, foreign exchange reserves of maybe $100 million in 1993 when they decided to go the capitalist route. And Mr. Deng said it's glorious to be rich and all that. Uh, and by the peak, they had $4 trillion. Well, in a natural world, in a free exchange market, nobody would build a $4 trillion worth of reserves. That's proof positive that they were intervening consistently, massively, to buy in dollars. And so therefore, basically, the inflation never happened in the dollar economy, but it caused a uh, you know, bloating of the entire financial system of the world, which in places like China led to massive capital investment and shiny new factories and you know, apartment buildings and infrastructure and you know, high-speed rail and all the rest of it. But it was really a deflationary, and this is what I have to keep telling people, it was a deflationary phenomena on a, um, a global basis because it created so much capital investment because capital and debt was cheap, you know, and China is a house of cards, that enormous capacity to build things and dig things and construct things and ship things and so forth, enormous overcapacity, malinvestment was created, and that had an initial deflationary effect on the world. That's why manufactured goods today, the index price level is no higher than it was, say, in 1999 on a lot of things. So unfortunately, a lot of people on our side were looking, making the wrong warning, looking in the wrong place. It still was massive monetary inflation, but it was global, and it led to deflation of goods and services, even as it caused an enormous inflation of financial assets. And so they were looking in the wrong place. They got discredited, or at least uh, you know, the establishment uh, uh, people, uh, the mainstream media constantly beat you over the head. Where's the inflation? Where's the hyperinflation? Uh, and frankly, we said, or you know, some of us anyway said, it's not going to be inflation in one country because everybody's doing it and they're doing it to protect their export industries and the whole world is going to be infected with this thing and that's where we are today. Now, the reason this is important, this is my blog this morning, <laughs> the reason this is important is that now that Trump has figured out that we did actually lose a large part of our productive economy uh, and, and the idea that we have, you know, uh, 
530 billion of imports from China, we only export 130. That's not natural, that's crazy. In the old gold standard, that would have been cleared uh, because we would have had a loss of gold and uh, you know, uh, interest rates would have gone up and deflation would have happened here and so forth. But there is no clearance mechanism in this world and the Chinese just kept buying up uh, our debt uh, and this uh, uh, crazy uh, uh, imbalance continued year after year and got worse after and worse. Finally, Trump comes along who's totally an ignoramus, utterly uneducated, about anything economically, and especially about trade. I mean, he's been uh, basically a 17th century mercantilist uh, for his whole life and didn't know it. Um, but he came along and said, I'm gonna fix this. And the one thing a president can do in our system, unfortunately, is raise tariffs under phony uh, section 232 and 301 investigations. He doesn't need Congress to approve. I mean. You know, we couldn't even repeal Obamacare because you couldn't get the votes on the margin. But suddenly, he's like the kid in the candy shop. He's discovered he has these authorities in year two of his administration, and now they're going nuts. I mean, we get so used to the news day after day, but the point is 250 billion of Chinese goods are already tariffed, and they've tariffed 110 billion of theirs, 85%, and it's now going to the next level. Uh, this is nuts. It's going to blow up the system, but most importantly, it's going to blow up the Red Ponzi, as I call it. And it's the Red Ponzi that is the ultimate answer to your question. That's where all of these excess dollars came to roost. And if you go to China, you can see it today in highways that nobody's on and 65 million empty apartment units and so forth. That's where it all came to roost. And so uh, I guess my final point on this is another silver lining of uh, the Donald's, uh, uh, you know, unlikely arrival in the Oval Office and discover, discovery of these uh, trade authorities, he's going to blow up the Red Ponzi. And uh, that will be a good thing, too, because uh, it will force the whole world economy to start uh, writing itself. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, what you just commented on was kind of exactly what I was going to ask. And you made the exact points I wanted to hear. But um, I was going to ask you maybe a personal question you might not be able to answer, and that's on Alan Greenspan. Huh. Um, I was wondering if you could answer what might be his personal motivations for what he did at the Federal Reserve. Um, I was wondering if maybe, like my personal idea is maybe that he's like Francisco Dan Connor in Atlas Shrugged, where he's kind of like a playboy that intentionally wanted to wreck the economy? Well, actually, he was the opposite. It's a great analogy. But actually, uh, Alan Greenspan was the nerd who could never get the girls, OK? Uh, you remember, he's a clarinet player, and he was kind of a bespeckled economist and so forth. And uh, that's a little facetious, but what I'm saying is he craved adulation. I've known Greenspan my whole life, and you know he's not completely bad, just mostly, uh, as it has turned out. But, uh, you know, I, I knew him in the 70s uh, when he was CEA director and then when I became budget director and he was uh, running his private uh, inve uh, advisory firm, I saw him all the time. He, and he had, you know, he had decent ideas. But he wanted to be in the circle of power. He wanted to be, he craved being uh, needed and important and listened to. And as I started out early today, uh, he, you know, got appointed to that job because they, were, they wanted to desperately get rid of Volcker and, and um, Reagan said, Ronald Reagan, uh, of blessed memory, said, well, you got to get somebody better. And they didn't because uh, Greenspan basically had, uh, um, you know, uh, become a pragmatist and had walked away from his prior views uh, long ago. But then when he became Fed chairman in the one and a half months after he took power, there's a 23% decline in one day in the stock market. Uh, some of you, I, a lot of you here I can see remember it, but just think of what it would mean today. L let's say by the time we got done with this meeting, the stock market was down 6,000 points from where you came into uh, this breakfast this morning. I happen to know that because I was giving a speech on October 19th, uh, uh, 1987, and I was in a room like this, and I'm kind of uh, gassing away, uh, talking about all these things, and 
was before cell phones, but the next thing I knew, one by one, the people were getting up, and then there was a murmur in the crowd, and I'm still ta I'm talking faster, you know, and I'm trying to get my uh, point across. And by the time I got done, the room was half empty because the word was spreading that the market is crashing in a way that none of us can imagine today. So literally 6,000 points, and it happened in two or three hours. Um, and so he stepped into the breach and quickly uh, stabilized the system in some ways that I've written about at length in the great deformation that were uh, not appropriate, but opened up the spigots and manhandled the Wall Street uh, uh, trading firms and investment banks to do business with each other, even if they knew the other side was a bad credit. But he, he, uh, he stemmed the slide uh, quickly and it turned around the economy. Everybody thought he was a great hero. And th that's the real answer. And he uh, suddenly found uh, all of this attention and all of this uh, glorification uh, so uh, amenable that uh, he spent the rest of his uh, 19 years doing the same thing. And we got, remember, the Committee to Save the World and the cover of Time magazine with Greenspan and uh, the other two uh, standing there. So that's really what it was. Uh, it, it's, and, and as we've always said, power corrupts. And that's kind of the bottom line that everybody should remember about what's so evil about the Federal Reserve. It's an unelected uh, Politburo. And uh, it, it creates people like Greenspan. Uh, it creates fanatics like Bernanke. He was nuts. It creates uh, school marms like Janet Yellen. I mean, she was worse. And we'll see where Powell goes. But until we get, and Ron Paul has always been right about this, until we get the Fed corralled and defanged, if not abolished, I don't think we'll ever get there, but uh, there's one reform that would sa save the whole thing. When it was created in 1914, there was not a FOMC. There was no uh, uh, open market committee. You could not own government debt, not a shred of it, not bills, not bonds, not notes. It was not legitimate. The Fed was only there to liquefy the banking system by buying real bills, which were, you know, trade receivables uh, or finished inventory. And if you went back to that role as a way station to solving the problem, abolish the FOMC, get them out of the government bond market, uh, get them out of the business of interest rate pegging and GDP management and so forth, it would be a huge step in the right direction. But until we do that, you're going to have the Greenspan uh, syndrome problem time after time in one form or another. So one more question. Unfortunately, I, I have to head, uh, head out. Uh, do, you, do you still think Trump will, be, will resign or be impeached? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Trump, he, he made like such a catastrophic mistake. And I wrote about this in my blog yesterday. He should have taken a page from Ronald Reagan's playbook. And Reagan uh, came in, we uh, inherited a mess, and he basically said, one, we're gonna puncture uh, the bubble uh, quickly, early, so we can move on. And so he empowered uh, Volcker to do everything that was necessary. That's what Trump should have done. He should have called Yellen in day one, January 20, you're fired, put in an anti-Keynesian, you know, like somebody like me or Ron Paul, that would have scared the hell out of the financial markets. Uh, there, you know, it, there would have been a complete uh, uh, collapse of the bubble, and then we could have dug ourselves out. And secondly, Reagan never stopped blaming Jimmy Carter. Even as the economy began to recover and turn up, it was this mess inherited uh, from Jimmy Carter. Now, Ron, uh, Trump has done the, he's such an egomaniac, that he gets a couple of good economic numbers, which are kind of random, we don't even have to go into that, and he embraces the whole thing, and now the big, fat, ugly bubble is the Trump uh, triumph uh, in the stock market, in an economy that's really on its last legs in terms of the uh, uh, aging and tired business expansion is the greatest uh, economy uh, ever or, or in modern times. So he's embraced the whole thing, and when this goes down, he will go down with it, because. He is, you know, he's put his jaw right out there, his glass jaw right out there to be smashed hard by all the political opposition. And who's the opposition? It's not just the Democrats, it's all of Washington. It's most of the Republican Party, <laughs> okay? And uh, as a result of that, uh, I think he will end up 
because I believe the stock market will crash in the next year uh, and the Republicans will panic about 2020 and total loss of Congress after they lose the House uh, in these uh, November elections. Uh, and he will be put on the, what I call the Dick Nixon Memorial helicopter uh, to his final ride to Gonsville. So that's uh, my thought for the day. Thank you. Thank you.